Okay, so. Let's try to add a little bit of CSS to our page, just a little. Uh, so, which is the preferred way to add, to, to create instruction for CSS to be applied to a page? The best way is to create a separate file that you can call it style.css, custom.css, whatever you want, .css, and link it in the head section of the, of the HTML file, of the HTML page. So uh, something like link href style.css. and say that this link is a style sheet. Hmm? So this is just linking a CSS file to the HTML. Uh, the other way is to, to add the CSS to an HTML page that are bad. The other two ways are adding the CSS inside the HTML page or adding, the, so create a section here for just writing the CSS or writing the CSS in line like style, uh, color, red. This is called in, in line because you create an attribute that's called style and add there the CSS. This is something that you may do for debugging, for trying quickly things, but it's not something that should reach a version where you deploy this or you give this for grading. Because this style is First of all, you are mixing the style inside the HTML. Mm -hmm. So you are mixing the structure and the semantic with how things appear. So this is in violation of the idea of having CSS and the HTML. And, but most importantly, because this style put there will override the style of the element P. Mm -hmm. And so you have to remember why this is appearing in red. Where is this structure? Where is this statement saying that this should be read? And you maybe are looking in the CSS file and you don't find it, but you see red. And so you have to look also in the, uh, in the tag in the HTML page and look for this instruction. So here it's pretty clear that there is something different because it's red, but if the change is smaller like a margin like something that you want maybe to replicate in another line, then you, you cannot replicate without copying and paste the code. And if you want to change the style for all P elements here, you, you cannot because this is overriding the style that you want to impose. So it's creating more complexity and more things to look for. So this is valid, this work, but it's better to forget about it and uh, we can, for instance, uh, so create a file that's called style.css and here define the style that we want. So for instance, we can say that um, the aside element has a background color uh, azure. So we are saying that all the aside tag in the page that link, or in the pages that link this style.css will have an azure color, background. Here on the projector is not really 
visible. Let me change it is in blue. That is not 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 nice, but at least is visible on the projector. And these apply to all the elements that are aside. Uh, or we can define a class mm, uh, like uh, text or colored text. And we can say that the color is, we can, so Visual Studio Code will show you a series of color. Uh, we can put it in uh, dim gray. Or we can define an ID that will say that the margin from the top is five pixel. So these are just instruction that you say you, you write in the CSS. And then you have to link this instruction with the HTML code. So what we are saying here, we are saying the first one in the side that all the side element in the page that is linked from here will have a background color that is blue. Then we are saying that all the elements that will have a class called colored text will have the text in, in this color, dim gray. And then we are saying in the third one that all the elements that has an ID called table head, we will have a margin top, or let's call it maybe bigger margin. Uh, let's say 25. Mm -hmm. All the elements with the element, uh, singular, with this ID, will have a margin top of 25 pixel. Mm -hmm. And then we can have selectors. Mm -hmm. These are called selectors. Mm -hmm. Then we can have selectors, more complex, let's say uh, these apply to all the children of P, these apply to the first children of P, if the first children is A, etc. to select mm, which property of style we want to apply. But mainly we have these three categories. On an element, side, P, body, etc. on a class, on an AD. And which is the difference between class and AD? The ID is unique. So in a web page, you must have one ID, one element with a specified ID. If you have two elements with, a with the same ID, it will get the first one. Mm? And this is true for, and this is especially true for JavaScript, mm? because also JavaScript can reuse this concept of class and ID. Mm? So class will get a series, a set of elements, ID will get just one. So here we can, for instance, say that P has class colored text. And the table has ID uh, bigger margin. It's not so big. So let's say oh, better. Hmm? So we apply that ID that in this case probably it makes sense to be a class if we just want to edit margin. Uh, but in this case, it's an ID. 
and we add this margin to the table, to the margin top of the table, and we apply the text color to the text. As a class, that means that if we have another element, we can reuse the, uh, for instance, the same class can be reused, I don't know, here. You can reuse the same class to apply to different element. Typically, with a meaning, not randomly. I'm doing now. Hmm? This is not something that we we want to obtain clearly. But this is quite a mess. But just to experiment with CSS. Hmm? But at least we are starting to give style, not a lot of structure, but at least style. Hmm? We are saying something as a background color, or something as as a different color because of some reasons and this table has a margin because otherwise it will be too close to the text and we want to spatiate uh, it a little bit mm -hmm. so uh, let's clean this a little bit so let's remove this class here and uh, let's reduce this margin a little bit and re-put this in a better color And here you can also have more instruction, like uh, font, uh, font weight, font style, and let's say italic. And so the text will also be italic. And then probably this could be my text or something like this because not all the color red or description maybe or intro better so you're just linking the HTML with CSS and if you want to change how the page appear you just have to edit this file once the class or the ID is, is there. Mm? So we can say that a side, but also footer, has the same background. And so you see that also footer has this uh, uh, bluish background together with a side. So you can give structure visually to the page starting creating this CSS by end. Hmm? Okay, any question up to now? This one, so let me get it this here because it's um, so that we have the full table. Hmm? So uh, CSS as units. You can specify units for margin, for text, for the dimension of the fonts, for anything that needs a unit. And, and these units could be absolute, absolute or relative. Absolute is pixel, five pixel, ten pixel, and it's written with Vx. And it's actually the dimension in pixel on the screen. Uh, relative could be different things, and is also an evolving list of units. Um, and they have this meaning. So it's always preferred to use relative units instead of absolute, because absolute depends on the resolution on the screen that you are seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, while relative is always relative to something else, like the, the, the height of a text, etc. And these are the five uh, most common relative units. Hmm? So there is EM, that is the one that I used, that is relative to the font size of the element. So one EM is exactly the same font size of the element. Hmm? So if the element has a font size of 12 point, one EM is 12 point. Hmm? Uh, two EMs, twice, 24 points. So it depends on the text or the font size of the element. Hmm? Rem is relative 
to the font size, not to the element in which the unit is applied, but to the root element, hmm? so to the HTML element of the page. Then there is other two units relative to the viewpoint, hmm? the viewport, so how, how much of the page is on screen, hmm? how big the window size of the browser is. Hmm? And it has, and that these are VW and VH, the state viewport width, so how width is the browser window, and viewport height, how height is the browser window hmm? and one of these is one percent the view of the browser hmm? the browser viewport either in one side or in one direction or the other hmm? so on a desktop computer this is relative to the size of the window on a mobile it will be smaller because the size of the window will be smaller uh, percentage instead is the percentage relative to the size of the parent element. Mm, so the element containing this. Mm. These are the relative units. So often for text you use EM because in this way you have all the text that are um, in proportions with the others. Once you set the default or the browser sets the default uh, style si the s size of the font, everything else is proportional to that. And you can write one, but you can also write one to two EM, so also uh, not integer number. Uh, instead for the, the size of the elements, like the A side, et cetera, uh, it's, it's typically used the percentage or the viewport units hmm, for sizing the elements. So like the sidebar is 30% of the entire page, hmm, or 30% of the viewport. If the viewport is 1,000 pixel, it's 30% of 1,000 pixel. If the viewport is the width, mm -hmm. or the browser side is 600 pixel, it's 30% of 600, always 30%. Mm -hmm. We'll always occupy the same space, increasing or decreasing the browser size in the viewport. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, so we, we have seen this briefly before mm, as the tree that the, the document of the HTML is parsed and, and split. Mm. So we have the HTML, we have the HTML, then we have the head with the title, with the actually the content of the title. And then we have the body with a div with inside other two divs uh, inside one div there is the table, inside the table there is the TR, inside the TR there is the TH, and inside the TH there is the text that appear inside the, the TH. And all of these for the entire table. Mm? So this is the structure of the HTML, and uh, the styles are inherited along these trees. Mm? So the style of the body apply to all the children automatically mm? and the style of HTML apply to everything in the body and behind mm? so you can put here the body or HTML uh, level the default definition the default things that should apply always like I don't know the, st the, the font style I would like to have Times New Roman or Arial or another font for my entire page and then it's the default for the entire page. And I can put it at a higher level because it's inherited down. And then I can say that for some element, I can have a specific rule. Hmm? And even if they are in conflict, oh, let's say that for the body, I have set a font, a font style Times New Roman. And for H1, I say that it's not Times New Roman, it's the Ubuntu uh, font. In that case, there is a conflict because there is body that say body and all the children should have Times New Roman. And H1 that say I have to use the Ubuntu uh, font. Mm? In this case, the most specific win. Mm? 
So everything will have, everything along the tree will have times New Roman, but H1, since it was specified for that, will just have the other font size. Mm? So the more specific win on the generic one. Here there is a syntax. Well, there are more than 200 CSS properties. Mm? And nobody remember all of them. Mm? Just to be, to be clear. And uh, luckily, we have tools like Visual Studio Code that allow you to autocomplete. Mm? So if you have seen before, if I write font, it gives me the options of attributes of properties related to font, the size, the, the weight, the, um, the style, etc., the family mm, of the font, etc. And so it, it will uh, allow us to easily recognize a font instead of um, a property instead of recalling how those more than 200 properties exist. And there are a lot of properties. Um, and there are the selector, but this should be in the reading also. So you should have already read it. Um, so let me go down to, here we have this style to this. Mm -hmm. So all, all of these are, are in the slides, but they uh, were also in the readings. So if you read the readings, uh, you can use the, the, the slide for a recap, mm, if you want. Um, so one of the cornerstones of CSS is the box model. Mm. So every element in a page is considered to be a box, a rectangular box. A rectangular box with this four properties, four element. There is the actual content of the element. There is the text, the image. There is outside of the content, there is the padding. The padding is, let's say, a space in the box after the content before the border. Mm? So like an internal margin. Mm? So you have the uh, imagine to have an image and then you want to have a black border around the image. Mm? The space between the border and the image is the padding. Mm? So a space that is before the border but after the content, all around the content. Mm? So like an internal margin before the border. Then you have the border. So this applies to every element, including the ones that we have used. Mm? But the ones that the we have used doesn't have border, probably didn't have mm, padding, and, and some of those have margin. Mm? So then there is the border. The border is actually a border, like the border that you can, um, you can, you can draw. Mm? And the border could have a color, typically it's transparent, but it could be a color of your choice, could be uh, a specific size, it could be 3 pixel, 5 pixel, 11,000 pixel, so a big border if you want. Mm? And that occupies specific space. And outside of the border, you have the margin. Mm? The margin is the space between one box and the other box. So it's the outside margin. Mm? The padding is the inner margin in a way, and margin is the outside margin, the space between one box and the other. Mm? And all these elements, the padding, the border, and the margin, not the content, can be set mm? independently, clearly, but also within, let's say, the padding, the margin, or the border, you can say that the padding on the top of the element has a certain size, and on the left and the right, a different size. Mm? Same things for the margin, we set up in our example, the margin top mm, in our table. So we just set up the margin here, specific. And here, it in the other size, in the other side of the box, it was the default margin, mm, or zero probably in that case. 
And you can see these browsers are, are pretty good in showing these. Uh, because if you go in inspect, you see here this picture that is actually the box model. So if you select an element, you see the specific box model for that element. So for the aside, we have a content that is 1019 pixel per 18 because the aside is very very it is not so high we don't have padding we don't have border we don't have margin so they are all set to zero if we go here in the table we see that the table at a specific size no padding no border but there's a margin that is now computed as 16 pixel because this is what the browser see, uh, what the browser renders. And so the, the, the margin was, I don't remember, 1, one yam, 2 yam, 1 yam. Hmm? And that means 16 pixel in this browser with this screen, with this resolution. Hmm? And, and you see here hmm, the box model, and you see also here the box model. Let me try to get the table. The yellow orange line is the margin, the same orange that we have here. So all the elements are built with this box model. So you always have to think about all these elements like boxes that have space between them, the margin, space inside them, the padding, and optionally a border. That could be transparent, but still occupy space. And the border between the padding and the margin. Mm. So this is fundamental. Mm. And so here you have, well, and this apply how, the, how big the, the element is. Mm. Because the element is not just the size of its content, but is the size of its content plus the padding, plus the margin, plus the, the, the border. So all of these is the size of the element, hmm? not just the, the content that you put inside. And the box model, together with the display in line and block, are the building model to various layout approaches. Hmm? And currently in CSS, we have three layout approaches, starting from the oldest, that is the float, and coming up to the more recent, that is flex, hmm? passing through grid. Hmm? So the, the slides after here speak in details about all of them. Uh, floats were the standard way of creating layouts 10 years ago. Pretty complex, hard to work for complex layout. Uh, in time, they introduces the grid that is actually nice not really useful uh, because it structured the page as a grid. So if you do, if you need to do a chessboard, it's perfect because you have a grid. If you need to do something a little bit more uh, elastic, then it starts to be too, too, too strict, too flexible because it's just a grid, a big table, structure the page as a big table with cells uh, that you can, uh, rows and columns and cells that you have to, to fill out or to say, okay, this cell is, expand to the other or, or things like this. It is it's standard CSS, but it is not really flexible. And to, and not, and has some difficulties in use. And then there is the newest thing uh, that is flex. Flex is easier to use from um, a perspective of the developer to obtain things that are have a layout how they, the developer wants or aims to have. Mm -hmm. With grids and floats, there is always more, oh, you have to put this float left, but also you have to set its display line different and this and that. A, a lot of small details. Oh, but this also depends on the float of the, of the father or the parent of this. It, it's always more, more tricky. 
and flex is easier. Um, so we are going to briefly see here there is all of this. If you are curious, um, so you see the grid. It's just a grid, but it's very, very strict. Um, uh, the flex box is more uh, flexible, mm, as the name say, uh, and allow you to give a structure that you want to page. So if you want to have really the sidebar on the left, it's pretty easy with flexbox, flexbox and also uh, is quite uh, adaptive. Mm. So flexbox has a series of properties that say the alignment of the object is on the left, on the right. The direction is horizontal or vertical. The order, mm, you have three elements, but you can style them in a different order than they appear written in the HTML page, if you want. Mm. You can say that the second element should appear as the third one. Mm. Mm. And the size, you can have three elements splitting evenly the, sp the space of the page, or you can say that the first one is twice the other two. Mm. So you give you a, a lot of flexibility, and they do this by introducing, uh, well, the container and items, mm, where the container is the box that contains all the flex items, and the items are the single element. And to do this, mm, uh, for the container, they introduce another display mode mm. so instead after display block block element display in line they added display flex mm. that give this property to any element that is that makes basically a display a flex container an element mm. so you have a, a side and you say that the side or the p is not anymore a display block but is a uh, display flex. And that will allow you to have all a series of properties to handle the content in a different way, in the way that is specified by flex. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in flex there is a property that's called the justify content that will give you content uh, horizontally uh, arranged. Mm -hmm. So you can have content with flex start starting from the left with flex end starting from the right and center content that is centered mm? and centering sphing was before flex one of the most terrible things to do in css mm? centering things that are not text was one of the most complex things to do in in css with flex this is actually easier and simpler mm? And also, not only the starting and the ending, but also the space around. Mm? I want all the sp the, an even space around each e element, or I want just the even space between the element. I don't care the space on the border, on the external. Mm? And wrapping, I can say that my element doesn't wrap, so go outside the page, or automatically wrap when the page ends, when the browser window ends. So new line when they, the ends with flex wrap, wrap, like text. End of the line, new line, automatically. This could be done with flex with elements. And these blocks here, this square, are actually flex squ square. So it's an image, it's a text, it could be other things that go to a new line automatically. Mm? Same things for vertical alignment. Mm? It's on the top, it's on the bottom, it's on the center of the page. And direction is something that you want to put in a row or something that you want to put in a column. Mm -hmm. So horizontally or vertically. Size, no flex, just four ele three elements with the space that they occupy. Equal flex, they are stretched to occupy all the space that can in an even division or unequal flex, in which you say that one of these or two of these occupy a space that is different from the other. So here in the example, you have the third one that occupies twice the space of the others, mm, of the single others. Mm. And here there is an example. Uh, you can also group elements and apply these properties to group of items, not just to single items. 
uh, if you want. And this is the summary of the properties about flags. Mm -hmm. And then there is also a game about frogs uh, with flags if you want to spend 10 minutes playing. Um, but most importantly, uh, Nabadi is basically creating CSS from scratch. So starting from an HTML page like we did and adding all the layout, all the style by hand. So either you are a company that have your own, creating a, a long time, your own framework, your own styles, your own library, your own components, and you use them for your products, or you use one of the CSS framework that are available. Mm? Most of them are even open source. Mm? And so for this course, we are going to use Bootstrap. Mm? So from now on, we are going to use Bootstrap as a framework for CSS that apply many modern styles to a web page, uses flex under the hood, so it's flexible, it allows us to do various things, as various components ready, the navigation bar, the buttons, different colors for the buttons. It already has a predefined style and takes care of cross-browser issues to try to minimize the difference between browsers. It's responsive or it could be responsive, depends on how you're using. Mm. So if you move from a desktop application to a desktop web application to a mobile web application, it's from the beginning starting to be responsive, so adaptive to different screen resolution as, as a simplified layout model that is very, very common to many other framework, CSS framework. Mm. So how does bootstrap work mm. so let's close uh, these oh on these i would like to mention one thing this is actually a html page uh, we created that uh, notice the url it's not http something it's file mm. with three slash file slash. oh it's not written sorry It's file, three slash, and the, fi and the folder on, on my computer. Mm? This is possible because the browser is the normal viewer for HTML pages. This is, is okay for trying HTML and CSS. Not everything that requires JavaScript work in this file protocol but it needs to be on HTTP, so provided by a server to work completely. So it's okay for trying with HTML and CSS, but moving on with JavaScript, is not everything is working because this is just a local file doing things. Other feature for JavaScript needs a server that provide, that serve these pages. But for right now that we are just focusing on CSS and HTML, this is good, this is fine, we can use it. And it's just opening the file with a browser. Mm. So I, I drag and drop the file on the browser window, essentially. And this works with all the files, all the browsers. Mm. OK, so let's uh, open the documentation of Bootstrap. Get bootstrap.com. So how Bootstrap work well you have to import bootstrap etc we are going to do it in a moment but i would like where they are and we have a starting template etc okay i don't find it the picture that i was looking for uh, but anyway, um, so Bootstrap is structured on, on the concept that the, a web page is made of 12 columns overall, maximum 12 columns. 
and you have 12 columns and you have to decide whether your element, how many columns your element occupies. Mm? So let's imagine the example that we, we have done up to now. We have a sidebar and a table. So we can decide that the sidebar occupies three of this column and table occupies 12 minus three, nine of the other columns, or four and eight. Mm? So it gives us a series of columns and we can decide whether an element occupies 12 of them or a subset of them. Mm? And it's able to put these elements one after the other, so with the sidebar really on the right and the, uh, the rest uh, on the left, or vice versa. And mm, so you have these 12 columns that occupy the space, which components occupy the space that you want. And inside this column, you have the concept of a row, mm, or better, around this concept, mm, around this, col the, this column. So overall, you have 12 columns. To use it, you have to define a row. Mm? A row is a space, a horizontal space, that is split in these 12 columns. Mm? So if you create a row, you can say, OK, in the first three columns of, of this row, I'm going to put x. And in the other nine, I'm going to put y. And then I can create another row. It could be high as you want. It doesn't have to be a, a small row. And in, in the next row, you have to, you can restart from scratch. You can say, okay, in this other row, I'm going to use all the 12 columns to do something. And then in the next one, in the next row again, I can use four columns for doing one thing, other four columns to do another things, another four columns to do another things. Mm? So you end up with a row that is split, the first row that is split in two, three, and nine. The second column that is just, the second row that is just all the space, and the, ter the third row that is split in three, equal part. Mm -hmm. So you can do, as you can imagine, all the layouts you can, you, you want, even inside a page. Mm -hmm. And all of this is responsive by nature. So if you resize the browser, this column can uh, go, can wrap. Mm -hmm. And so if there is no space for three, it will be two, and then the, the, the third element will be in a new line, et cetera. Mm? So let's try to use Bootstrap to create, mm, in, the, in the half an hour that is missing, to create something like this, mm? in which we have a navigation bar, and then we have the footer that is on the back, on the, on the bottom of the page, and then we have a table that is centered, more or less, uh, in the page. So it's not 12 column, but it's maybe nine column, eight column with the other column empty mm, uh, on the left, on the right of the table. Mm. So let's start from the, uh, the same document. Mm. And let's call it index two. And here, let's remove this, the import, and let's remove the sidebar that is empty. And everything else is the same thing that we created. So if we open index two, we see our table as before. So how we can add bootstrap? So the first, the easiest way to to add Bootstrap is to use, uh, here it explain you what you need to, to do to add, but is to use the template, the starting template. Mm -hmm. So Bootstrap needs that here in the add you have some required meta tags. And then you need the Bootstrap importing the bootstrap CSS. Mm. So here, we're going to copy and paste this and have a look at this. So we added two meta tags. One is the char set of the page that is UTF-8 and the viewport. The viewport that say, 
the defined internal viewport of the page saying the width of the viewport is the same viewport of the browser, the device width, and the initial scale, the initial zoom of the viewport is one, so it's 100%, no zoom, no anything else. This will allow us to adapt the viewport to different resolution, yes. Get bootstrap.com documentation, getting started. So on the Bootstrap website, that is getbootstrap.com, if you go on get started, and here there is starter template. So here we have some meta tags and we have the CSS of Bootstrap, because we need to import the CSS. As before we imported our own CSS, now we are importing the CSS file created by Bootstrap, but with the same methods, link, href, rel, style sheet. And then in the end, after the body, in the end of the body, we can also add is not needed right now, but we can also add this line here mm, that are optional JavaScript for interactivity. Mm. Bootstrap is a CSS framework, but already give you some interactivity, like buttons that expands, etc. And this is in their own JavaScript file. So here at the bottom of the body, just before the end, we can copy this script. And just to have a look, we can have, let's see, well, not the layouts, because they're not really useful um, as a picture, but for instance, we are going to need a navbar. Hmm? So bootstrap has a navbar. Hmm? And you see, in the documentation, it's pretty easy. How do you take this navbar? Well, if you want this navbar specifically, this is the code of the navbar. This is the code of this navbar, exactly this. And this is the default navbar, then you want to edit the, the brand of the navbar, it tells you which is the CSS class to use in HTML, and it gives you an example of application. And this example is exactly these two previews. Hmm? If you want to have images in the navbar, here there are the code for adding images like this in the navbar, etc. If you want to have buttons, disabled, not disabled, mm, there is the preview and the code for that specific preview. Mm. So it's, it's always uh, learn by doing. Mm. If you want a navbar, you want to add a navbar, look at the navbar, copy the text, edit it to personalize and then proceed. Mm. So look for the navbar that is closer to what you want to do. Do you want a search form? Here there is just the instruction for the search form. It's mostly copying and paste and editing. Mm? Because either you have the structure or the structure is forced by Bootstrap. Mm? So like here you have an input field and the button. And if you want that, you need to add an input field and a button with all the classes that Bootstrap give you. Mm? And if you go down, you can see for instance that the navbar had also color scheme. So if you don't want the default color scheme, you want this bluish, the last one, you can also have that. And this is, um, uh, and this is, uh, let's take another one, uh, like a model, this is live. So this is the code that launch a pop-up and you can also try it directly and this is the javascript that is provided by bootstrap mm. so you can this is the code that generates this button here and the content in this button mm. so you, you also have a live preview how things work before applying it in your program mm. so and this is in general for all the elements and you see here there is a lot of elements there is the accordion mm. opening and close there are alerts Bars color, there are badges of bars type, there are buttons. You can have buttons of multiple colors and size and dimension. 
cards image, title, text, button, or a subset of these, etc. Mm? Popovers, that is tooltip. So a, a series of things already uh, available. And for instance, and these are the components, but then if you need to style a table, you can look for tables, and here there is the code for this styling this table, and in this page, all the options for styling a table that bootstrap has. So you can say, okay, I want a table with this color, and I can do it. Mm -hmm. Here there is a code to do this. And so starting putting together things, you can obtain the results that wants. And if you want to change something, just create uh, your own CSS style, and overwrite this one. Mm. So Bootstrap has its own properties. You want to change the margin of a table, create your style, add another class, for instance, and write that your margin is margin top 1 AM. And so you're overwriting the default style of Bootstrap mm. in a cascading way. So after, you have to write your own, after importing the Bootstrap style because otherwise it won't be overwritten. So if we take ours, we just added the Bootstrap CSS. We didn't change anything in the HTML. And refresh it, we can see that already something changed. The font changed. The button changed a bit. The spacing changed a bit with respect to the original one. And this is just applying the default bootstrap style. Mm -hmm. So let's try to add a navbar. Mm -hmm. So navbar is here. Mm -hmm. So this full navbar reported here as a class navbar, navbar expand, navbar light, that is the color of the navbar, etc. It has a container hmm? that is a container fluid, means 100% of the space. And this is the standard structure in Bootstrap. You have a container, you have a row, and you have the columns. And then you can have another row or, or another container, and the container clear everything. Hmm? So you start again from, from scratch. And the container can be fluid or not fluid. Mm -hmm. Container fluid, 100% of the space container, it's at each breakpoint. Mm -hmm. And you have various breakpoints. Mm -hmm. That is, apply for container, but also for rows. That is extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, and XX large. And these breakpoints are for the responsiveness. So you can say that a table, no, um, a some elements are maybe three column in large. That means that the web page will occupy, that element will occupy three columns starting from 992 pixels. So if the screen size is bigger than this, will be three columns. And then, you can say that for small, it would be five, 12 columns, so all the space. And so this means that for 576 pixel and up to 900, up to the large, hmm, that portion will just be one big thing per row, instead of three, one after the other. Because you say occupy all the space instead of occupy just three, four columns and, and make the space for that. Mm. And so this applies for containers, but also apply for columns. Mm. So you can specify how much space you are using according to the screen size you are in, so the screen width you are using. So you can have the same structure that appears in a very different way according to the screen that you are targeting your web page for. But we, we are going probably to, uh, uh, we are going to, to write something in Bootstrap, then if we don't finish,
today I will put a complete version online on GitHub so that you have also the complete version. So uh, we need to add, we say, the navbar. The navbar, let's go here. Uh, you see the navbar is responsive. See what happens, also in the preview. This is the navbar, right? This is the same navbar as before. It just automatically collapsed. Mm -hmm. And the elements are here. This is the same code acting responsiveness in, in this preview. So you can also preview how an element behaves mm, in different resolutions. So the navbar, let me put it smaller. The navbar is the things that we'll need to replace our header with. We just, we don't need all the button. We just need the navbar. So we can keep the header if we want, just to specify that this is the, the header, and we can add the navbar. Mm? So first line, you can copy and paste. I'm going to write nav, mm, that is a HTML element to specify that this is a navigation element. It's not specific for the navbar, it's not specific for bootstrap, it's just HTML5 elements for any kind of navigation. Nav, uh, class, and here we are inserting the classes, the bootstrap classes. Mm. So navbar, uh, navbar light, and BG light. I'm going to skip navbar expand because I don't care in this moment about the responsiveness. Mm. Even also because we, we don't have anything in navbar, just the title, so there is nothing to be put in a responsive way. Mm. So that is something that say that expand after LG, after LG as a breakpoint on the screen, as a screen resolution. Mm. So here we have the navbar. The navbar will just have our Uh, brand like this uh, navbar here. Mm -hmm. So we need div class container fluid as written here. And, and here you see that the navbar is this A class navbar brand. Uh, in our case, it's not um, a link, because it's just a title. So we can, instead of writing a class, we can write span class, and then navbar brand. Mm, that is the same class used before. Mm. And we can also add h1 as the class. Because if we look below, you see that you have two options. One is navbar as a link, and one is navbar as a heading. And navbar as a heading as H1 as a class. Let's say that is a heading. Instead, here, you don't have anything in the other link. And you also have this MB0. That is, let me copy this class also that is a way for m so if you find in bootstrap this syntax two letters minus a number it means this thing the first letter identify the uh, the property m margin p padding b the second letter identify what in that property B, bottom, T, top, L, left, R, right. Mm. So here we're saying we are using a class that set the margin, bottom, to zero. We are removing any margin from the bottom of the element. Mm. 
if we write m t1 we are setting a margin top of 1 am if we write m x we are setting the margin on all directions top bottom left right x stands for everything so here say it's a navbar brand like this doesn't have margin on the bottom and it should appear not like a link but as a header so bold than the other version if we say save this and go here and refresh the page we see yeah you don't see a lot but we see that it's, it's actually a navbar with uh, the background so let's change the background let's use the uh, the dark background so that is easier to see and background primary okay yeah I don't have uh, I left to h1 uh, the browser actually uh, work the same because it's try to close the tags when you don't uh, this works most of the time in other cases creates wonderful behaviors uh, because it try to close the tags at a certain point and sometimes that point is not the right one so in this case it was easier uh, but you see if we refresh basically it doesn't change anything because it, it got not saving it got the it understood that it was span and should be closed by span not by h1 hmm? so we added the navbar and navbar dark just to it's written in documentation but just to give you this i changed nav it was nav, navbar light i put it navbar dark that means the text the contracts of the text navbar light as black text my exam was black navbar light navbar dark put the text in light in white because the background is expected to be dark and so the text should be contrasted well enough to to be seen on a dark background and the background is set with this bg background it was bg light because the background was light uh, bg primary primary is this blue also bottom primary is a bottom of this color blue so navbar dark because the background is dark it's not not black but it's dark and bg primary is the color of the background So we did the navbar. So now let's start doing the container. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me not open this, but we said that it should be a div class container. Container fluid container fluid 100% of the width and we so you see that the text is very very close to the navbar so we can add a little bit of margin between the text and the navbar and we can write mt3 for instance margin top 3 so we replace the main with the div so let me close the main the here div So if we try this, you see that the table already spaced a little bit from the margin. The, the text was spaced a little bit on the margin. Good. And then here we need to container. We need to add a row. Hmm? So div class row. And these are all CSS uh, that are specified by bootstrap and we are going to close the row after the text so 
that that is the space of the row. And then the, tab, the table will be in another row. Uh, and here, the text will remain uh, basically the same. The only difference is that P should have a class that say how big the text should be along the 12 column. And we can say that the text is all the columns. So call minus 12, or call without minus, minus just call will mean all the space available. That in this case is 12. And if we refresh this, we don't see any big changes, at least not in this small view, but still we are set up everything in a proper way. Uh, and actually this could be also could, could say the main, it doesn't need to be a div. And then we can do something similar for the table. Let's just start to, to set up this. Mm -hmm. So we have div, class, row, because we need another row. And after the table, we close this row. And then we need to move this table one indentation. And here we can say that the table as class table, for instance, just to see how it appears. So we just added the table class, it appears just in a different style already. And if we want to have, you know, the table right now is 100%, always 100%. We would like to have it centered a little bit. So we can play with columns. So we cannot play, trust me, you, we cannot play with columns here in the table class. It doesn't work because the table overwrites the columns. The definition happens before the one of the columns, so it overwrites. Uh, the others, we need to add another div if we want to edit the columns. Um, so div class, and here saying, so putting the table inside another div. And say how many column we want to occupy. So we can say that the column from the size LG will be 10, and the table will be automatically centered. So column LG 10, 10 column, not 12, 10 column. We can also put eight or nine, just 10 column. And we want the margin in all direction automatically. That will put the table centered. So if we save, you see that already the table shift a little bit But if we enlarge this, you see that the table stay centered. And then if we reduce this at a certain point, it doesn't, it isn't anymore centered, it just occupied. At a certain point, look at the table, all space centered. So when we so go over the breakpoint of LG, that was 900 and something pixel, the table occupy all the space that has. So instead of 10, like now, it occupies 12. So you can rearrange things just putting table size in column like this, okay? Okay, I will, I will put this um, on GitHub and then I will also complete it maybe in an index three so that or in the same document in same HTML file so that you have also the full version with buttons and the footer. Mm. And notice one thing before going. Notice what happened to actions. 
it disappear. Uh, it disappear, uh, but I told you that Bootstrap is responsive. So why disappearing? Uh, it disappears due to this element, the, the calendar picker, because again, this is styled by the browser and implemented by the browser. Mm? So this has a specific wide, fixed wide. Mm? And so Bootstrap cannot resize it because it doesn't behave, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have control on this element, on this specific element. If you get rid of this and use text as input field instead of date, the table will appear in the page, even if the page is very, very small. Mm? So make attention, pay attention when you're using standard elements like this one, because they are not ready to be responsive, always responsive, mm? like in this case. And this was the last thing. Uh, Evan, I say they, if you have any question, I can stay here for a few minutes still while I unplug and see you on Thursday. <laughs>